Good morning. Uh, we're pretty full over here this morning. I say we were a little lopsided because all of Ewald's family is here for his birthday today, but uh, we're pretty full. The balcony is actually empty this morning, so it's good to have you with us today. Uh, I would say what a great morning it is, but it's another foggy, dreary, cloudy morning. So, um, But you guys always want moisture, so you've been getting your answers to your prayers. So hopefully we'll have some sun this week and uh, things will dry up a little bit out there for you. Uh, a few announcements today. If you're uh, looking for food this morning, the, the Armor firefighters are doing their pancake breakfast till 12 o'clock. So if you're busy here this morning and you're done and you're hungry and you're not always already going to lunch with the family, um, you can go get some, some uh, breakfast food in Armor to help support the firefighters. Um, there's food downstairs as well, so you're kind of taken away from the firefighters, Ewald, because your, your snacks downstairs will fill up people here, but uh, there's also food down there for his birthday. Um, probably the big thing for this week is uh, Rance Rankin. He's a recent new member, helps out with confirmation class, and uh, is actually, I think, our third elder. He would normally be helping with communion this morning as well. Um, his wife, Annie, went into the hospital earlier this week, um, gallbladder uh, stone issue, um, up and down all throughout the week, ended up going to Sioux Falls, got the gallbladder removed, the stones are stuck in, stuck in her duct. So the, the stones are still in there. They took the full time they could um, under anesthesia to get the stones out. They weren't able to. They have a stint in there now to try to get them to, to pass and drain out on their own. Um, she was looking and being pretty rough still yesterday, but Rance reported this morning that um, they're hoping she should be able to come home today. She'll have to go back in a couple months to either have the stint removed or have the stones removed if they haven't come out on their own. But hopefully she'll be stable enough to come home. Um, he hasn't expressed any, any needs, but he did say, because I know sometimes people want to do meals or help out in some way when she does get home, but Annie will have a new restricted diet because of the gallbladder thing. So if you are thinking of helping out in some way, just make sure to check in with Rance ahead of time. And he also warned that his driveway is a mess, just like all of our driveways are a mess right now, so except for the townies like Louie and Donna. Um, but uh, yeah, so just uh, keep them in prayer though. We'll be praying for Annie this week and continuing to do that. And we sent out updates via email as well this past week on that. Um, uh, so we've, we've been doing, uh, focusing on a hymn each month and a Bible verse each month as a congregation. And I, I know I was really blessed by that last month and then actually um, with the stuff Rance was going through with Annie and the, the Micah 7-7 seven, seven verse is actually pretty helpful for him in that and it was really helpful for me in my struggles. So I hope January was good. Our February verse, if you open your bulletin, we'll read through it together here for the first time. But our January, our uh, February verse is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, and we'll also be hitting on it a little bit during our sermon this morning. But we'll read that together as a congregation for the first time today. And it goes like this, and it should be familiar to most of us. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And in that bent, in that theme of God's faithfulness of being there in our temptations, um, it, our hymn for this month is, Great is Thy Faithfulness. So again, another one that should be familiar to us. And, and my hope is that we get these things just ingrained in our hearts and minds so that when we're going through a struggle or we have a friend or we know somebody is going through a struggle, we can be right there and say, hey, let me tell you about this verse. Let me sing this hymn with you. And, and, I, and I especially hope that we're teaching that to our kids intentionally rather than just picking it up as a habit because we do songs each week over and over and over again. And so I want, I want that to be an intentional thing we do to really prepare us. And then here's a good reason for that. This is a news-related item, and this touches a little bit on our sermon today. And then right after this, we'll go to our call to worship. Um, but recently in our nation, Paul Vaughn is, uh, we're going to pray for him this morning as well, and his fellow protesters. But Paul Vaughn was one of six pro-lifers facing over a decade in prison over a peaceful protest. And uh, so they were protesting, a, 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 they were pro-life protesting an abortion. And uh, from Paul, he says, I'd say that I was marginally on the sidelines. 
um, speaking of his involvement in pro-life activism before his trial. We were doing a little bit of sidewalk counseling. We weren't trying to do some national event. We weren't trying to be a big name. We're just trying to be Christians and just going out and helping a person here and helping a person there just live our life in such a way that honor God. But if anything, what this has done, speaking of the persecution he's getting right now, I'm already, I'm ready to start a national organization. I'm ready to go head to head with these people, the, the government who's trying to put him in jail. If they want to bring me into the fight, they should have thought before they swung because God is big and he is powerful, he added. And then Vaughn added that his faith has only grown throughout the long ordeal and that he has received messages from Christians all around the world as far as Tasmania praying for him. And so I have a copy of the article in my office. If you'd like a copy this morning just for more information, um, feel free to stop by. I'll make a copy for you. Um, but we want to keep them in prayer. Our, our nation is uh, turning a blind eye in many ways on crimes uh, that are committed that should be punished. And then they're punishing people who are innocent and have done nothing other than talking to people about the risks and dangers of killing their child in the womb. And so I'm thankful that God's people are willing to fight. And I hope that we're being built to fight where necessary as well. Hopefully we don't have to go through such persecution, but as he said, our God is big, our God is faithful, and we'll speak to that this morning more. But with that, I invite you to rise as you're able as we call to worship this morning. And our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 147. We'll read it responsibly together. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of men. But the Lord delights in the law of the Lord, and in the law of the Lord. We continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder each Sunday morning that you delight and take pleasure in us who have sacrificed our time to be with you who have, have shown a desire to come to you and to learn from you, from your word this morning, and, and to come into worship and, and to sing with you and for you. And so, Lord, we ask you to minister to us this morning. Give us strength in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirit, in our soul. And make clarity for our way that we may know our purpose and our intention that you have for us. Lord, give us your identity this morning. Make us clean and prepare us to be with you one day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our opening hymn is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Good pleasure. 
safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. And the grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to Thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. But you to rise as you're able. We continue on page two in our hymnal with a confession of our sins before our great God. We bow our hearts and minds before the Lord, confessing together. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace, we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God the Father in heaven, have mercy upon us. O oh God the Son, Redeemer of the world, upon us. O oh God, the Holy Ghost, you comforter, have mercy upon us. Declaration of God's grace to us this morning. Our mighty God, our heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us. He has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become sons of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, to us all. Especially on a communion Sunday, we come up to the, in the presence of God and one another. And I was thinking as we were going through our confession this morning, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy. You come to God because of his mercy. And he comes and he says, I don't see sinful your, insert your name here, I see a ch precious child that I created and that I love and that I give hope and peace and power to. And so you can come into his presence knowing that if you've confessed to him and submitted to him, your sins are removed. There's no shame, there's no guilt, there's no fear. And you can come up here with joy. You don't have to come up in fear and trembling. And so that is why I'm always smiling during communion because I'm full of joy that we get to commune together with Jesus and with one another. So take that to heart this morning. You may be seated as we continue with our readings. Our first reading this morning from the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. And we'll be We'll be using a little bit of each of our readings, just a small portion of each of our readings this morning will be included in our sermon, so, so take heart to what's read here. I won't reread all of them during the sermon. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. 
He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is discarded, disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Here ends our Old Testament prophet lesson. We continue in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, as we continue with our epistle lesson. Beginning in verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, and by all means, I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I I myself should be disqualified. Here ends our epistle lesson. I invite you to rise for the reading of our Holy Gospel. Our gospel lesson this morning is from Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 29. And immediately Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and Jesus would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here ends our gospel lesson. God be praised for his last Continue our service with the confession of our faith as found in the Nicene Creed on page 18 in your hymnal. We confess our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried 
And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Congregation may be seated and invite the ushers to come forward at this time for our offering. Thank you. Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we were able to come into your presence today, that we're able to return to you a portion of what you've blessed us with. May you use these gifts of financial as well as our time and our energy and time spent with you. Lord, multiply these things and bless them in a way that makes your name known in our lives and in our communities. May you give wisdom to all those who manage these resources of time and talent and treasures. Help us to be following your instructions for our lives and your guidance, Lord, and not our own human hearts, which are sinful and deceitful. And so bless us in that, Lord, as we consider how we are to use our lives. And we think of our lives this morning, especially Ewald's life, as we celebrate 80 years. And, and, and each year that you give us is a precious gift. And we ask, Lord, what are we, are we using them well for you? And we look back and we can see where you've blessed us and where you've lifted us up and gotten us through tough times and challenging times. And we see you when you're joyful as well and, and great times of 
of blessings such as uh, family and friends coming together or successes and and things that we've achieved and so we ask your blessing upon him and his family this morning but we think also of each of our families in our own lives Lord that they are a blessing from you help us to live each day with thankful hearts and to be thankful and gracious to others as well as we see them in their struggles that we might bring them the joy and peace that we have and the hope that we have and Lord, we ask you to be with Annie as she recovers, and, and we, we hope she's able to come home to recover at home more fully, Lord, and we ask that you um, r- remove her pain and discomfort and that she can uh, kind of begin to understand what the, the new reality physically will be going forward, and uh, bless her in that, Lord, and we're thankful for her faithful husband, Rance, who has been taking care of her and doing such a great job of ministering to her and, and to others as they lift him up in prayer too, Lord, and so we're thankful for them and ask that you bless and protect them and take care of them and guide them to whatever you are working in their lives for them. Help them to understand and see why, Lord. Why did this happen now? What are you teaching them through that, Lord? And may they appreciate and feel your presence fully this morning as they spend time with each other and you this morning. Heavenly Father, we lift up Paul Vaughn and all the others who were with him who were under persecution just for trying to talk to people who were going to get abortions. And and we ask you, Lord, to, to... provide them wisdom and understanding, help them to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves as they face uh, the mighty legal system which seeks to punish them for doing good and is lacking in punishing those who do evil, Lord. And we cry out, just as the Israelites did often in the old days, we cry out for justice and truth and righteousness to reign in our lives and in our kingdom. And so, Heavenly Lord, we ask you to Give them hope and understanding and give, equip them with the things they need to be able to stand up and fight. And we ask, Lord, and we look forward to seeing how you will triumph and fight for them in this battle. And it's a good thing for us to be encouraged as well to see that you are there in these battles when we stand for truth and we stand for you and we stand for those who can't stand for themselves. And Lord, whatever else may be on our hearts and minds this morning that may be hindering us from submitting fully to you, Lord, or that we may be stumbling with or maybe wrestling with and we're asking why. Why Why are we lonely? Why are we empty? Why are we struggling in some way? Why are we physically struggling, emotionally struggling, or spiritually struggling? May we be always asking you, Lord, because you are the only one who can give us the answer. You are the only one who can get us through those times. You are the only one that can help us to understand that you have a plan. And so help us to lean on that this morning as we turn over to you whatever it is we personally are wrestling and maybe hesitating to give to you in this moment of silence. As these days of fogginess have kind of weighed down in our hearts and maybe depressed our spirits a little bit, Lord, when we finally do see the sun again, may we remember this moment and remember you in that time that you will bring sun into our lives when we need it most and when we're most ready to receive it. We lift all these things up in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We continue with our hymn, number 14, Now Jesus at the Door is Knocking. Calling, O 
Oh, heed my soul, what he does say. Deny him not, O thought appalling. And learn him not to me a day. to pray with me as we begin. Heavenly Father, be with us as we open your word and, and help us to understand what are you saying to us now in this moment, in this month, maybe this year. Speak to our lives this morning through your word and through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Usually as I study the, the scriptures that I'm looking ahead to the sermon and, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of, a title will come to me. And that'll kind of guide where, where I'm going connected to the text. And so I had the title set, and then when I was going back to look at the text again, I was like, wait, I don't know how well that connects. <laughs> um, but it does. It really does in a, in a, in a different way. The, the text that we're looking at today, we're going to be touching on our Mark passage briefly, and then we're going to go, uh, we'll, we'll see how these all things speak to who God is and his faithfulness, and we'll look at our psalm, and, and our Isaiah passage a little bit, and then our, our First Corinthians passage. So they will all tie in, and we're not going to be up here forever. I got the timer going. It's Communion Sunday, I know. And, um, but the, the reality is that, you know, I, I, the who's there part of our title is who's there in your heart. You know, we think of knock, knock, who's there, the jokes that I'm afraid to teach my kids because I know how annoying they are, and I don't want to hear them over and over again, and I don't think they're funny. But to a, an eight-year-old or a five-year-old, they're hilarious. But if you knock on your heart, if you knock on your friend, your best friend's heart, you knock on your boss's heart, or you knock on your neighbor's heart, who is there? Is Jesus in their heart, or is Satan in their heart? Is there good in their heart, or is there evil in their heart? We need to make those assessments. We need to make those judgments in order to understand life and what, what we should do with the life. And so we're going to speak to that a little bit and, and, and draw that out of these texts. And so this is probably the, not as directly from the text. These texts, we could speak on many different things. But this is our focus this morning. And it makes me bring to mind some additional texts that you are probably familiar with. Revelation 3.8, where it says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word, God's word, and have not denied the name of Jesus. And in that same passage, it speaks of the synagogue of Satan. And so, like I said, when you knock on the heart, when, when you, and you open that door, is it, is it a meeting place of evil and Satan, or is it a meeting place of God and truth? And then also the door in that passage that is open and that no one is able to shut is the door of salvation. The only one who can shut that is, is no one. Satan tries, and the most he can do is prevent you from going through it. But that door is open to everyone as long as you submit to going through the door and to the one who has opened it for you, to Jesus Christ. Nothing can hinder you but your own heart and your mind and your will. And then Revelation 3.20, Behold, Jesus is speaking here, I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking at our hearts. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And then our theme throughout life, really, but especially in this moment and in this month, is God is faithful. If you cry out to him, he's knocking at your door. He, if, you, if you open the door, he will come. He will eat with you. He will come to you. Nothing is hindering him from coming to you. Not your sin, but your 
obedience to your sin, your submission to your sin instead of to him, because that's what clings your sin to you. Otherwise, he'll take it away, which then allows him to come in and eat with you and you to be with him. So keep those things in mind as we look at our Mark passage in verse 34. So jumping down a little bit, it says, Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. He came into the world to find his people. And his people were in bondage to demons and to, to diseases. So they were in bondage to physical things. They were in bondage to spiritual things. They were in bondage to mental things. They were in bondage to, to whatever you can think of. And who has power over it? They didn't. They were enslaved to it. They were stuck under these things. And then their God came to them and he freed them. Matter of fact, he exercises his authority over those demons that they had in their minds and their hearts, not even allowing them to speak because they knew the truth of who it was that was casting them out and had authority over them. Our God is powerful, as, as Paul Vaughn was testifying to in that moment in the article that we read this morning. There is nothing our God cannot do if we allow him. And then at the end of our Mark passage, Jesus says this to them and to us. He says, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And then he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues. That would be like their meeting places, not even necessarily like church, but just their gathering places where they would gather and talk through the word of God and casting out demons. Again, because of his authority and his mission. His purpose wasn't to come and, and to be popularized in a book that would sell everything, outsell everything out throughout history. It wasn't for people to say his name everywhere, although God does desire that. He came for us. He came to be the one dwelling in our hearts. That's right. <laughs> the kids are feisty this morning. Psalm 147, 10 and 11, the, the, the later part of that passage we read this morning. His delight, God's delight, is not in the strength of the horse or the tractor. It's not in the size of your farm. It's not in the size of your bank account. It's not in the, 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 the size of your kids or what they've accomplished or what they've done. His pleasure is not in the legs of a man or what he can do or his abilities but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. And that's not a terrifying film, but those who respect and understand he's the boss, he's the authority. He's the, the, the guy dictating how the farm's going to run. He's the one dictating how the house is going to be run. And in those who hope in his steadfast love. That's what God delights in. He delights in those who say, hey, come into my heart, be in my heart, have authority over my heart, over my mouth, over my actions, over the things I do, over the plans I make. And they don't have to do mighty things. He's not looking for those. He's just looking for people to be faithful and trusting just as he is faithful and trusting. He's looking for those who hope in his love, in his work, not in the work of their hands. And then Paul, in, in Corinthians passage, again, the whole separate sermons could be written on this many different ways, but we're drawing out today, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, the good news. Paul is beginning here, he's speaking in this part because he's telling them, you know, I'm not coming to you as a speaker. Last week we had a speaker, and I've heard a lot of great feedback that you really appreciated him, and I'm thankful for that. He's a good friend of the family, and that's why we had that connection to bring him down. But he didn't, he didn't come here in order that he would speak and that we would throw money at him and support him, although he does appreciate making money as, a, as his career. But he spoke because... God did something in his life and he can't help but share about it. And that's what Paul is saying here too. I, he's not saying it in a proud way. I come to Corinth to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, not that they would support him financially. Matter of fact, he, he talks about how they would work. He would build tents and, and he would be working in these towns to make money on the side so that he could speak without having to have 
the poor churches pay for him. I'm not making any comments here about you not paying me because I do need to support my family. But the reality is if you didn't, I would still do it because that's what God has called me to do. And I don't do it out of pride. I don't do it out of ability. I do it because I've just been called to do it and this has placed me in this spot. That's what Paul is saying as well. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I just come up here and, and like a lot of pastors in the land these days, if I just start preaching to you self-help stuff and I don't bring God into it and I just say, you can be the better you, be the best you that you can be. It's like, no, be the best child of God you can be. Don't trust in your riches or your wealth, but trust in God. It's a divine compulsion. We have to do this. All of God's people have to do this. Matter of fact, the closer you get to God, the more you trust in him, you can't help but do it. And everything you do, everything you have becomes a blessing. And the, the health of my children, I credit to God, not anything I do. He's guiding that and directing that. And then at the end of our Corinthian passage, Paul speaks of the race, and again, many sermons on the fact that our, our faith is like a race. Because it, you have to exercise it, and you have to practice it, and you have to, to discipline yourself in order to have a good faith. I hope as a church that we've been doing that with our, with our daily reading plans, if you've, whether you follow one of your own, being in the Word regularly. Last year, focusing on worshiping together as a family. I hope that you're carving time out each day as a family to read God's Word together, to, to sing a song or a hymn together. I'm doing my best to try to give you tools and equip you for the race that you are running. But I can't run it for you. And I can't force you to go to practice. And I can't force you to exercise. I can't force you to, to, to then run the race. I mean, I can maybe drag you to the starting line, but it's on you to leave when the, when the gun fires off. And then to consistently persist with it. And then I can do my best as God equips me to come along and, and provide water along the way. And to give you a map to say, no, don't go that way. You've got to go this way. This is the better way, the quicker way. And to encourage you. But as Paul says in verse 26, do not run aimlessly. You need a plan. It needs to be intentional. Do not just box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control. Actually, the, the language there is very much more neutral than, it, than the original language is. It's literally just beating yourself and hitting yourself into submission to make your body submit, your sinful self submit to God and the will of God. And why? So that after preaching and sharing what God has done or what he's doing, that you don't then get disqualified as well. There's a goal here, and Paul's goal is the same one that was Jesus' goal, which should be the same goal that we have, winning people to salvation. Paul's goal was not to save the Jewish nation. Paul's goal was not to create God's kingdom on earth in the sense of like the Jewish state or nation. And this is the struggle we have right now in our culture Jesus would not be in our land fighting to save a national, national idea and identity. He would be in our land to save people. If you save people, then the people will have a national identity in Jesus Christ. That should be our focus. Each individual person, just as Jesus came down to us and he healed individuals, people who had names, people we still read about today, like blind Bartimaeus, and even Paul, who he had to come and show himself to in order to submit him to God's will. So Isaiah 40, as we begin to near the end, Isaiah is writing in a time frame where the people of Israel, God's people, when it says, O Jacob and, and O Israel in verse 27, that's a way of saying all those who are the, God's people. We would say nowadays, we say all those who are Christians, all those who are trusting in Christ, why do you say, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? In other words, why are they saying, where are you, God? We don't know what's going on. How do you help us when the world's falling apart? And their reality was captivity in Babylon. Somebody had come in, another nation had come in and taken their people away. 
their land, which they maybe had pride in, their homes, which they maybe had pride in, the routine that they knew, the life they knew was complete. They were taken to another nation. And this is what Isaiah says to them. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall be fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. And we heard that language in our Micah passage last month. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God hears me. Micah 7.7. 7. Why does that matter? Because of our verse that we're focusing on this month. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Every man, every woman, every child will die one day, hopefully later in life, that they might have a full and rich life, but we will all die. That is common to man. Every one of us will struggle and face temptations of some kind. They will not all be the same. Not all of us will have muddy driveways. Not all of us will have to get up and do chores in weather that's awful. Not all of us will have the financial resources we need. Not all of us will have healthy children. Not all of us will have healthy parents. And those things will come and they'll go and it's common to man. And not all of us will have the same temptations or the desires that will turn us away from God or from our neighbors or from our families. But the reality is, no temptation has overtaken you or caught up to you in that race except for that which is common to man. There is nothing you are facing that somebody else hasn't already faced, including Jesus Christ. And in that temptation, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. How do we know? Because he knows you fully. He knows your ability. Why are you tempted? Why do you have these trials? Because he is testing you and he wants to see, are you going to turn to me? Are you going to open the door and let me in? Or are you going to turn your back and try to do things on your own? Are you going to lock me out and allow evil things in or try to do it on your own, in which case you will fail? He knows your ability. He will not let you be pushed beyond your ability because he loves you and he wants to save you. But with that temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We see many in our culture who are falling prey to that and they're they're exiting this world because they don't have the strength. They don't have the power. But I can tell you, no matter what you're facing, if God is a part of it, this truth, this verse is truth true to you and for you. But notice, God is the absolute necessary portion of that. He may use his people to get you through your temptation. He may use his people to get you through whatever your low point is or your struggle. Because we're all running that race. We're there to encourage one another along. But at the end of the day, he is the one that you must be calling out to as your coach for life, as your guide, as your one that's going to get you across the finish line. And if it is not God that you're turning to in that, if you have made something else God, money, talent, physical health, whatever it is, if you have made that your God, then I leave you to what you will reap. It will not be winning the race. There will be suffering because God will not be in it. You will not find a way to endure or overcome it. And you will fall, just like many examples in the Bible and in our own culture and day. So I ask you as we wrap up, knock on your heart daily and ask, who is there? Is Jesus there? Is God, your creator, the one who knew you and made you and formed you, is he there? If he isn't, please come to me or another Christian brother or sister and and dig into the word, find God and invite him in. He will come willingly. He's waiting for you to open the door. That's why he came. That's why we're here. And if he is there, then okay, let's work together. How can we help you in your struggle? And if you're not struggling and you're strong and great, how can we seek out those who need our strength? And then after you've knocked on your own heart, Knock on your spouse's heart. Do you see Jesus there? Is God there? Your sons, your daughters, maybe your parents, grandparents, your neighbors, those who you interact with daily, is God in their heart? That is the reason we, Jesus came. It's the reason Paul was converted 
to be zealous for God, it's the reason that we are in this world as well as God's people, to seek and save the lost. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, help us to examine our hearts daily and to be in spirit with you, Lord. Guide us into your truth and then equip us as you've faithfully promised to do so that we may do your work and in long in that be blessed through it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We continue our service with our hymn of the month, Great is Thy Faithfulness. continue with our order of communion service. Dear friends in Christ, in order that you may receive this holy sacrament in a worthy manner, you should carefully consider what you must now believe and do. 
From the words of Christ, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. You should believe that Jesus Christ is present with his body and blood as the words declare. From Christ's words, for the remission of sins, you should also believe that Jesus gives to you his body and blood to strengthen your assurance that your sins are forgiven. And finally, you should do as Christ commands you when he says, take, eat, drink of it, all of you, this do in remembrance of me. If you believe these words of Christ and do as he has commanded, then you have properly examined yourselves and you may eat Christ's body and drink his blood in a worthy manner. You should also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for so great a gift, and should love one another with a pure heart, and thus with the whole Christian church have comfort and joy in Christ our Lord. To this end, may God the Father give you his grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue in prayer as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on a night he was betrayed, took bread, and after breaking and giving thanks for it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after he had supped, he took the cup, and after blessing and giving thanks to it for it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lamb of God's most things have been prepared, the congregation may be seated and come forward at the direction of the ushers.
rise as we close in prayer. Let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, almighty and everlasting God, for having refreshed us with these, your gracious gifts. We ask for your infinite mercy, strengthen our Christian faith, support us in the trials of life, and make us fervent in our love for you and to our fellow men. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you, give you his almighty and everlasting peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.